Did you know tequila production and wine producing is practically identical up to a certain point? We're going to talk about that and more on this episode of the Tequila Hombre coming up next. Welcome to this episode of the Tequila Hombre, where today we're going to talk about how identical wine production, grape wine producing, and tequila producing are up to a certain point, up to distillation, of course. Um, but we're going to talk about some similarities and stuff. Basically, where this came from is, as you may probably know from watching my other videos, I'm a national champion home brewer. So I started brewing beer um, when I started on my journey in the alcohol world. And I actually won a national championship. I really studied fermentation and studied the science and stuff behind brewing and how to do it right so you can produce top quality beers. And so I've always had this fascination in the science behind fermentation. And what, what basically happened is I was learning about tequila and they kept referring to when I'm, when I'm in Jalisco and talking to mezcaleros and stuff, they always, they kept referring to the tequila as vino de mezcal, which is wine of the mezcal. And so I was like, well, why do they keep referring it, referring to it as vino de mezcal? And what I found is actually fascinating. So let's not waste any more time. Let's talk about the similarities between grape wine producing and tequila production. Okay, so as you know, the actual fruit used in both processes is completely different. For tequila, they use the piña ball, the root ball of an agave plant, of the Weber blue agave plant, that's basically full of starch, but they still need to take a bricks reading on it, where in wine production, they use grapes, right? And they still, when they harvest grapes, they still take a bricks um, reading on it as well before they know whether it's right to harvest. So there's some similarities in that they look at the sugar content of each, they take a bricks reading from the agave, they take a bricks reading from the grapes, and so those are very similar. But, you know, the difference with, with Weber Blue Agave is that it needs to be hydrolyzed first to convert the starches to sugars. So they typically will cook it for 24 to 48 hours or even longer sometimes, depending on what process they want to use to convert the starches to sugars. With grapes, the starches turn to sugars automatically by the sun. So that happens with enzymes and stuff inside the grapes. And so when they ripe, it turns from starches to sugars inside there and gets from being sour uh, and possibly bitter to being sweet. So that's the difference there in the fermentable sugars, but there's some similarities to the fermentables that's actually kind of amazing. First of all, after they um, extract the sugars from the agave fibers, um, the, the fermentable liquid is called mosto, which in Spanish, in English, it's must. And in wine, when you get the sugars when you squeeze, press the grapes and get the sugars out of the grapes, that is also called must. So mosto is must in English and you have must for wine. Now, one thing that's kind of really interesting about the two of them as well is their composition. The mosto from tequila consists of primarily right around 80% fructose and 20% glucose. And it's the same with the grape must. When you squeeze the grapes and you get your must, it's primarily 80% um, fructose and 20% glucose. But the glucose can change on them too the longer you let the uh, grapes go on the vine. If you try to do a late harvest, you'll get more glucose because the, the grapes, the enzymes in the grapes will actually convert the fructose to glucose the longer they sit on the vines. And that's why if you ever had a late harvest wine, it tends to be sweeter, more like a dessert port type wine, but when you look at what, when they're harvested regularly, the composition of the must is practically identical. Okay, another interesting point is both fermentable fruits need to be pressed in order to extract the sugars for fermentation. So with agave fibers, after you cook them, you put them through roller mill, add a little water and press them um, to extract the sugars out of the agave fibers. Where grapes, you just put them into a grape press, de stemmer presser, and it will press the, the, the sugars out of the grapes and, um, and take the stems off as well. We don't have to worry about stems with agave fibers and stuff, um, but you basically are creating the must by squeezing 
the grapes as well as squeezing the agave fibers to get the sugars out of both of them. So after you extract the sugars out of the grapes and the agave fibers, the next step is fermentation. And of course, with both of them, you can do wild yeast fermentations if you want, because the grapes will have uh, yeast on them, as so as the, the agave, the agave um, piñas will also have yeast on them when you cook them and stuff. And they can actually start self-fermenting themselves. Um, or you can use yeast that you pitch to do the fermentation. Now, if you actually look at the way the kind of yeast that a lot of the producers use out there, they use basically wine yeasts to do the fermentation. You'll see champagne yeast used a lot. You'll see other wine yeasts used a lot, uh, but they also use bread yeast and other yeasts as well. And that could be something that we could look at as far as improving fermentation and improving the flavor profile of tequila. If we incorporate some of the things that are done in wine into tequila production. And we'll get into some more of that a little later. All right, so after we've got the juice squeezed, then we have to look at fermentation. Fermentation can happen with grapes with the skins or without the skins. Without the skins, they typically do for your white wines. And your red wines, they put the skins in because they want to draw tannins and, and other flavor elements out of the skins to help with the body of the wine. You can do the same thing with tequila. You'll see te some tequila producers will actually ferment with the fibers and um, some without the fibers. Now, both of them have compounds called terpenes in them, which will actually add flavor compounds into the, into the, um, the must as it's fermenting. But they also can, you can, the yeast can also extract additional sugars out of both the skins for the grapes as well as the agave fibers. So the only difference that, you know, tequila producers is, is they don't know if it's worth it to keep the fibers in there because it's extra work to clean the fibers out of the fermenter. Where with grapes, um, they typically want the skins in there for red wines to get it, draw tannins out as well as the terpenes and other flavor compounds that will add to the body the, the pro and the flavor profile of the red wine. Now, um, a lot of the similarities between the two still shows in the fibers as well as in the, um, the grape skins because you can actually draw tannins out of the fibers from the agave fibers as well as the tannins out of the grape skin. So there's a lot of similarities there too in the composition of the plants and the kind of things you can draw out of them when fermenting with the skins or with the fibers. So that's why you'll see special additions done when they fermented with the fiber. You'll notice a richer flavor profile from it somewhat uh, and some other different elements, some different flavor compounds that are in a tequila that is aged or that is fermented with the fibers versus without the fibers. Same with red wine. You want to use the skins to draw color out. Otherwise, it will be a yellow wine. Now, when... Um, the batch that I'm doing now, I'm doing a Zinfandel. And if you guys want to follow along the processes and stuff, um, go check out the Ombre Cave channel. I'll be posting a video of the whole process of making wine because I'm actually jumping into winemaking to learn more about tequila production and to give me some ideas of things, special projects that I can do with some tequila producer friends that I have that um, would make, I think, an amazing tequila. So we'll experiment with that as well. So make sure you check out the Ombre Cave, go subscribe, and you can follow some of my winemaking adventures uh, as well as right now I'm making a batch of Zinfandel from um, grapes that we picked out here uh, in a local vineyard. All right, so after the yeast do the fermentation, both tequila and wine, a second fermentation happens uh, pretty much automatically in red wines and, and white wines unless you stop it. Same with tequila production. During and because of the compound and the makeup of the must, there's another acid that's involved in the must that bacteria will then start eating and fermenting after the primary fermentation has happened. And the reason why it doesn't happen during ferment, the primary fermentation is because during primary fermentation, there's um, an environment of carbon dioxide that's within the must. And these bacteria can't live in that carbon dioxide environment. They can't propagate and live. So what happens is after primary fermentation has ended and settled and um, the carbon dioxide is like dissipating and stuff, then what happens is a second fermentation will happen automatically. And with, with yeast, with, 
tequila production, they typically try to stop fermentation then by transferring it into the still and doing distillation. So typically it's like five days or so um, that the fermentation is complete and they will move it. Uh, some will let it go a little longer. So uh, a malolactic fermentation will happen. And, and what happens with malolactic fermentation is the bacteria culture that that is in the in the mosto for the tequila, the must or the must for the wine will start eating malic acid that's in the must. And when it eats that malic acid, it converts it to lactic acid and it creates other compounds like diacetyl, which will give a butter, a buttery kind of um, flavor profile to it. And with tequila, you'll notice it's butter or it's even kind of a cheese funkiness that can come from a malolactic fermentation. You pick up some cheesy notes. And if you try the um, the Hoven that I did with Cascanas that I made with Cascanas, that's an example of, of a malolactic fermentation gone wild. Um, that's like an extreme malolactic fermentation. But a lot of times you can pick up buttery, uh, slight cheesy notes and some tequilas when they let the malolactic fermentation happen a little bit. Where in wine, they do it for red wines primarily. You'll see it in some white wines like Chardonnay where they want a buttery Chardonnay. Um, they'll let they'll do a malolactic fermentation in it, so the malic acid, which will lend a tartness, a green apple kind of uh, flavor profile to the white wine, um, that gets eaten by this bacteria culture, and then it will give it more of a buttery uh, flavor profile and calm down the tartness. The same with the red wine; it calms down the tartness, makes it more rounded, gives it a more um, rounded flavor profile where it's not so uh, tart and acidic, it doesn't taste so acidic um, when you're eating it so you, or drinking it. So you'll notice a lot of red wines will do a malolactic fermentation and allow the malolactic fermentation to complete before they um, put it in for bottling and, and aging. So malolactic fermentation is something also that's very similar, that's actually identical between both tequila production and wine producing, and it happens in both pretty much automatically. Uh, but in wine, since they sulfite a lot to, to preserve the wine and keep wild yeast from doing the fermentation, um, a lot of times that knocks out the malolactic uh, bacteria. So um, in many cases with wine, they'll actually pitch a uh, malolactic culture and that way they have more control over the, the malolactic fermentation. So after the malolactic fermentation happens or after fermentation, it's basically where the similarities in production kind of ends because with tequila, it goes to distillation. And then with um, wine, you can, if it's a, you want to age it, you can put it in a barrel and age it, which tequila you'll do, you can do after you're done distilling. Um, and it's going to be higher proof. Wines are typically 14 to 16% on average. Um, there's some higher proof wines as well, or higher uh, alcohol content wines as well. Um, but you typically see them between 12 to 14 percent, um, where tequila in the United States is a minimum of 40 percent. So there's the higher alcohol, higher ethanol content, and the fact too that tequila is distilled. So looking at these similarities, it makes a whole lot of sense on why they called tequila vino de mezcal de tequila originally, because it is basically a wine, a wine that's distilled. And some things now, you know, for me, make a lot more sense. Some of the really good tequila producers out there now. For example, um, David Ravondi and uh, Colin Edwards from Cascanas. Cus David Ravondi is the one that makes one, two, three organic tequila as well as El Luchador. Um, he's a big wine guy and he actually lives in, in the wine country in California and uh, is a huge wine in, um, connoisseur. And uh, Colin Edwards is a wine guy as well, um, makes wine, loves wine, is pretty much like an expert on wine production and wine and even produces his own wine as well. And these gentlemen, I guess, took what they learned in wine production and used it in tequila production and produced some really nice tequilas. Now, one other person I've been talking to a lot, and I've actually been involving him in this project where I send him updates and stuff. Jimmy Salza um, is somebody who also is a big wine guy as well. And he actually backpacked through Italy um, tasting Italy and basically uh, learning about flavor profiles and stuff. He's a big wine drinker as well. And uh, I've been actually going back and forth with him, sharing some of the findings. And he's been telling me some stuff that he's learned about wine production and tequila production, things that made him a better um, tequilero, a better tequila producer. 
Now, one other thing that really is similar between the both of them and plays a part in both wine production as well as in tequila production is terroir, right? Is the earth, the ground, where the agave are grown, where the grapes are grown. You can have different flavor profiles from grapes that are grown in Napa Valley uh, versus like the Temecula Wine Valley here or in France. Uh, same with agave. Um, there's different terroir from the Los Altos, the the highlands of Alisco versus the Valle, um, which is the lower elevation valley region of tequila. And depending on where the tequila is grown, uh, the, the agaves are grown, you can actually have different flavor profiles um, based on the terroir. And the same thing is with wine. Uh, terroir plays a big part in it as well. So there you go. There's some big similarities between tequila production and wine production. Actually, they're almost identical to wine. And so I've actually learned to appreciate wine a lot more because of my appreciation for tequila. And if you know somebody that's a wine drinker that's hesitant to try tequila, tell them about this. Tell them about how similar they are and uh, and maybe sh show them this video so they can learn that tequila is not what they think. It's not just the party drink that tastes the same as the Jose Cuervo they tried back in the 70s or 80s or 90s when they were partying and drinking the the, the gross tequila. That would be the same as like drinking um, Thunderbird or Mad Dog 2020 wine. <clears throat> there's really bad low quality tequilas. There's really bad low quality wines. But the nice thing is with both of them, you can get some really interesting flavor profiles by playing with um, terroir from where the agave are from with fermentation and um, which fermentation contributes most of the flavor profile in both um, alcohols, both wine and in tequila. Fermentation contributes the most to the actual flavor profile of the tequila. So taking this knowledge that I'm learning from producing wine and, and, and experimenting with things, what kind of things do I think we could do in the tequila world that could actually help improve and make some really amazing tequilas? Well, I think one of the things that I've noticed a lot with tequila production is the fact that they don't do temperature control. So with wine, any winery you go to, <clears throat> the fermentation is under temperature control. They, they do it in a closed fermenter <clears throat> and they control the temperature to be within the range of the yeast that they're using. Where in tequila, they do it in open tanks outside. They use the whatever the ambient temperature is and it can get very hot in areas of Alisco in the summertime. And when it gets very hot, it produces a thinner distillate, um, <clears throat> less flavor molecules are, are apparent. And that's one of the things I noticed when we did the Carrera 54 high proof with the Camarenas is we went really cold on the fermentation. And that's why you get that really rich agave flavor profile in it. So I think some of the things that we could see happening, and I'd like to, to work and do some experimentation with some tequila producers on, is working with more of a controlled temperature environment for fermentation. Now, some other things that I think that maybe tequila could learn from um, wine is that you, with wine, you can use the, the wild yeast and do a wild yeast fermentation. Uh, and that can have different um, influences on the flavor profile. But you'll find a lot of producers that make wine um, professionally um, will have their particular yeast strain that they like, that they stick to, um, instead of allowing wild yeast to go and start fermenting the wine. So they'll add sulfites and stuff to it to stop the, the wild yeast from working and, and bacteria from working on the sugars. And then you know, use their, their um, preferred yeast, which I did in... In my particular batch that I'm working on, I had a preferred yeast that I used. And you can watch that in the video um, that I'm putting up of the wine production. So what I'd like to see maybe happening, and there's actually one distillery that um, I was talking to Juan Eduardo up at uh, El Viejito. He does his fermentation in closed fermentation tanks. And one of the things that he said to me, which really makes a lot of sense and rings true, is that he does that because he wants to control what's at, what's changing the flavor profile of his of his um, tequila of his mosto. So he wants to make sure it's his yeast that's doing the work, and he can keep it under control by not allowing any outside elements to um, impose their flavors and stuff on his and his must. 
but there's not a whole lot of distilleries out there that do that. Instead, they do open fermentation where they'll just let whatever the natural yeast is in the area and go to work. Um, and sometimes that may not give the best flavor profile. So what I'd like to see happening, and this is something that I'll probably try to work with some of the master distillers on doing, is doing a small batch deal where we do it in a closed tank and we do it under temperature control um, to see what kind of amazing tequila we can produce following kind of what wine production does uh, in their procedures. Now with the Carrera 54 particular project that I worked on with, um, with Mauricio Camarena, one of the things he expressed to me is that he really thinks the flavor profile that we did was so amazing that he's actually going to look to closing off his fermentation area and installing air conditioning system in there um, to control the temperature of the fermentation area. And that's another way that we can do a temperature controlled fermentation. And that way, um, before when he was trying to duplicate the flavor profile, he was waking up at uh, midnight, one o'clock in the morning, and doing his propagating and pitching then so that his um, must was at the right temperature and not during the hot afternoon heat that's up there in Arandas where he wouldn't have any control over the fermentation temperature. Now with fermentation too, um, you know, it during fermentation it produces CO2 gas. It also creates heat. Uh, so you want to make sure you have a way to keep the fermentation vessel cool um, and cool it down so the yeast itself doesn't heat up the fermentation hotter than you want it to be to be within the ideal range of the yeast that you're using. One of the things I've also learned too in talking to like Sergio Cruz at 1414, and I asked him, we said, what is the, what temperature do you think you've gotten the best results at from your fermentation? And he told me 10 Celsius, which is, which is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So he said in the, in the early um, winter, like January, February months there in around us, it's like 50 degrees out. And he says, that's the best, he gets the best flavor profiles fermenting at that time. So I may work with him on doing a special project where we do a smaller run on something in a, in a temperature controlled tank or come up with a way to, to do a temperature control on the fermentation to keep it at a consistent temperature for a yeast profile and see what kind of special batch we can produce. And then of course, bring it in for the Tequila Barrel and Agave Collective to um, try. So this is kind of the cool experimental things that I like working with and testing with um, to see what kind of interesting flavor profiles uh, we can create to help really um, create some amazing tequilas. There you go. So if you decide you'd like to play with um, wine producing, because you can produce your wine at, at home legally in the United States, it is absolutely legal to, to make wine. Check out my channel, or even if you want to learn more about wine production and tequila production, check out my channel, The Ombre Cave, where I'll be posting a video of this batch of Zinfandel that I'm making, where we went out and picked the grapes locally here, um, crushed them, did, we're doing the whole process here in my garage, um, creating a 30 gallon batch of wine from Zinfandel grapes. And you can learn about, I talk about all the different steps and the things that we're doing and the chemistry and the science and stuff behind it. Um, and if you have a friend that's into wines that you're trying to get into tequila, have them watch these videos too, uh, to introduce them to the idea that tequila isn't the party drink, uh, get trashed, uh, kind of drink that m a lot of people think it is because of the history that they've had with it in the past and that it actually can be really, uh, an amazing spirit for people that enjoy complex alcohols and, uh, flavor rich, um, alcohols like wine, like grape wine, uh, and could be something they could, they could really enjoy. I've noticed that my appreciation for wine has increased since I've gotten into tequila. I was never much of a wine drinker, but now I love a bold red wine. My palate's really um, progressed towards enjoying the, the flavors and stuff that are in a nice red wine, as well as coffee. I mean, believe it or not, my Palettes actually, and I enjoy coffee where I never really liked coffee before as well. So palettes change, and this is a way too to, to introduce some other flavor profiles and to pick up other flavor notes uh, through um, understanding and enjoying red and white wines. Well, there you go. Hopefully you enjoyed the content and information provided in this video. If you did, click the thumbs up and give me a like. If you're new to the channel, bienvenido, welcome. And if you want to get some great information about tequila production, um, 
and as well as unbiased, uh, honest reviews of of tequilas that are out there, make sure you click the subscribe button right there and the notification bell next to it. So you get notified every time I post a new informational video or um, unbiased, honest review. So you get notified and you can have the, the, the power, your knowledge is power. So this way it'll gives you the power that you need when you go into a liquor store to know whether you're, produce, whether you're purchasing a good quality tequila or not and what to look for and and know that you will not be sold something that you're not gonna like by a sales rep in a liquor store that doesn't know any better. And like I always say, life is too short to drink bad tequila. And one of the ways to make sure you're drinking good tequila is to understand the processes and know who's doing it. Salute, bye guys.